I want you to open your Bibles with me tonight in this 26th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And we just read a couple of verses again just before we come to the ministry of God's infallible truth. We'll commence there at verse number 27, the challenge which the Apostle Paul brought to the king upon that seat of judgment. He said this, and remember, uh, Paul was the one that was being judged, and yet he turned that whole scene completely around, and we find that he puts, as it were, King Agrippa in the dock at that moment. And this is what he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, I want to take you tonight to us on a journey. I want you to come to the scene in Caesarea where there is this passage of God's Word being fulfilled before our eyes. And in this 26th chapter and 25th and 26th chapter of the books of the Apostles, I want us to see Paul making his defense before King Agrippa. Now, I want you to imagine this scene, friend, because let me tell you, it was not only simply Festus and Bernice and Agrippa and Paul there, but there was a great gathering of people, because notice what Paul said there in that verse, in verse number 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, you see, friend, at that very moment, there was a great company of people of the rich and the famous, and they were all listening to Paul's message, which he brought there before King Agrippa that day. And you know, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking of this thought. I wonder, friend, I wonder will we meet somebody in heaven that was in that crowd that day? I wonder there will be some person that was standing listening, not recorded here in the Word of God, but standing listening to Paul as he brought a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Agrippa. I wonder is there someone in that crowd that God used that message to bring them to Jesus Christ? Because let me tell you, quite often we never hear. There's people that we never knew about that in gospel meetings and in gospel missions, and we hear perhaps, I think of a, a person who told me over 30 years afterwards that they were saved in one of the meetings, and I never knew about it. And they've never told others uh, uh, to tell me about it until they did some 30 years later. I wonder in heaven, will there be somebody in that crowd listening to the Apostle Paul giving a clear message of the gospel that was brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ? But the challenge was to King Agrippa. He was Herod Agrippa II. He was the son of Herod Agrippa I. He was the great grandson of the person we know as Herod the Great. And this Herod Agrippa had come to Caesarea because there was a new governor. You remember us in the previous chapter, Felix was in the governor's post, and then he's no longer there. And the Bible tells us that Festus took the place of, it says there in verse 23, if you go back, verse 22 of the previous chapter, chapter 25, then Agrippa said unto Festus, and, uh, uh, and I will hear the man myself tomorrow. And that was the Festus that took over from King Agrippa. And Agrippa's uh, in chapter 24, and Festus came into his room. And now whenever that Festus has come to be the governor, King Agrippa II has, got, has come to, to welcome him. He wants to be in a good relationship with the governor of Caesarea. And whenever he comes to Festus, he finds that Festus has a problem. You know, whenever they talk together and as they share together and in their conversation, Festus tells Agrippa about this preacher man, this man called Paul, and how that he has been, uh, has been charged and how he has appealed to Caesar, his case to Caesar. Now, whenever that Festus was writing up the case to send to Caesar, he has to have a charge. But he's got a problem. He really did not expect that what the charge would be was what, what the preacher was preaching. 
He thought it was something that, 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 that uh, he had done against the law of the nation, and yet he hadn't. And so therefore he couldn't find a charge to write down, and he couldn't send Paul to, to Caesar without the charge. And so he says to Festus, you know, Festus, I, I don't know what to write. I don't know what accusation to put down here, but maybe you can help me. Festus says, well, I will. I, I listen to him. Well, said Festus, if you listen to him, then you'll be able to figure out what I should put down on paper and send as a charge going to Caesar. And so the day came, friend, whenever this great meeting, it says there, chapter 26 and verse 1, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, You see, friend, that moment came whenever Paul would stand Agrippa. Look in the previous chapter, verse 23, And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And so the scene set. And there is, sitting upon the judgment seat, there's Festus sitting beside him, is Bernice sitting also, is Agrippa. And now Paul is brought in. Whenever Paul is brought in, immediately, immediately Festus sets the scene. Look at verse number 26. I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not with all to signify the crimes laid be against him. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And immediately we find Paul standing in the presence of this king. Now remember, there's great pomp. Everything is done. My, he's standing in the midst of this, this great scene before a king. And the Bible says in verse 1, Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. Now, friend, the stretching forth of the hand wasn't to silence anybody. He wasn't asking the people to be quiet. The stretching forth of the hand was a common gesture of an orator who was opening his discourse. Now, as he holds forth, friend, remember this, probably Paul is chained to another, uh, to, to one of the soldiers. I know that certainly he speaks about the bonds in verse number 31 of chapter 26. Accept these bonds. And so therefore, he's standing there, but he holds out his hands, and he commences his defense. Now, notice how he starts. Verse number 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused. Light. I want you to notice that Paul is considerate. He makes no criticism of the display of pomp. He doesn't refer to Bernice. We'll come to her. He doesn't refer to her and her reputation. No, no. Paul was intent not to offend. And he was not there to defend himself. But he was there to defend his master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, to Paul, friend, the cause of Christ was more important than anything else. You know, sometimes you and I can get our, our backs up and somebody says something to us, and then we, friend, we, we, we say things that we ought not to say, and we lose our testimony. We think we can just shoot the mouth off just and say something because we're defending ourselves. No, no, Paul's not defending himself. He's defending the cause of Christ. And therefore, Paul is very polite. He's very considerate in the way that he speaks. Now, Paul explains why he considers himself happy to stand before the king. And this was the answer, friend. 
You see, he knew that Agrippa knew the customs of the Jews. He knew that he was an expert in the traditions of the Jews. He knew that Agrippa was a person who was aware of all the events that had occurred. He also knew that Agrippa, a Jew himself, knew the Scriptures. And so therefore he was happy to speak for himself before Agrippa. You know, he conducts himself, as I see this, he conducts himself with great wisdom here. Look at verse 3. Especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. I want you to listen to me carefully, Agrippa. I want you to be patient with what I have to say. And friend, what I had to say was summed up in the words that Agrippa spoke later on. Verse 28, Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And what he wanted to talk about was not about himself. He wanted to talk about Christ. He wasn't defending himself because, let me tell you, he realized that his life was in God's hands, not in Agrippa's hands. Because he had committed himself unto the Lord years before that. But he's pleading for the soul of the king that was before him. There's some simple things that I want you to notice, friend. Notice the task. What was the task that Paul had set himself? Notice what Agrippa said. Almost thou persuadest me. See that word, persuade? That's exactly what Paul was wanting to do that day. He was wanting to persuade Agrippa to become a Christian. And friend, let me tell you, that was the objective that Paul had. As I said, he wasn't defending himself. He was seeking to save the soul of a king, to reach Agrippa for Christ, to win Agrippa for Jesus. Now, friend, his life was on the line, but he didn't care. There was a precious soul that he was standing before And as he looked into the eyes of Agrippa the king, an ungodly man, Agrippa tried to persuade him to be a Christian. And friend, let me tell you, that's the objective of every gospel preacher that stands in a pulpit. Whenever a preacher takes the pulpit, he's not standing there to seek the the audience's admiration. He's not seeking to influence them about himself. Because, friend, to be honest, that wouldn't be worth going into the pulpit for. He was seeking to persuade Agrippa to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest me to be Shakespeare, to be or not to be. That's the question. And whenever Agrippa looked into the eyes of this Apostle Paul, he said to him this, he said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And that's what Paul's labors were all about, friend to win men and women to Jesus. And friend, that's what this gospel meeting's about. To win men and women, boys and girls, to Jesus. Do you remember what what, what Paul said in Romans chapter 10? He says, My heart's desire and prayer to God, what was it? That they might be saved. That's all he cared about. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Listen, I challenge you fathers tonight in this meeting. Tell me, what's your desire for your sons? 
What's number one, mother, for your daughter? You want the world to laud them and applaud them. You want them to climb to the highest reaches of success. That the world is falling at their feet. You want them to be a millionaire. Is that your desire? Is that all you have for your child? And all you want from them? You're sad. Because let me tell you, friend, the day your child's carried down the road in a coffin, there'll not be a penny in their pocket. Their shroud will be empty. And they'll leave it all behind. There's no greater desire for any parent to see their family saved. That's number one. And if it's not, friend, you're not right with God. You can say what you like, but your heart's not right with God. And that's not number one you have for your child. Because let me tell you, my friend, what an awful thing to your child to go through life. Yes, even come to be a millionaire and then be put into a little plot of, of earth. And their soul going to hell for all eternity and curse the day that you ever reared them because you put their wealth and their possessions before God and the salvation of their soul. The Bible says, He that one is wise. The very last appeal in the Scriptures, it says, And the Spirit and the Bride says, Come! Come to Jesus! That's the burden. That's the task. And then that was the task of Paul's life from the day God saved him. When he fell in the dust and then he rose and he cried to God, Lord, what wilt thou have me? To do. And the Lord told him, I have this purpose, verse 16, chapter 26, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. As a, and a witness, you're my witnesses, the Lord. You're going to minister for me. That's the task, that's the purpose that God had for the Apostle Paul. And friend, until the day he died, this is what he was able to say then in the end of the journey, in light of that purpose. He says, I fought a good fight, and I finished the course, and I kept the faith. There's the task. But notice the teaching. Almost thou persuadest me what to be? To be a Christian. Now, here's the question, friend. What is a Christian? And do you know that in this chapter, we have a very apt description given by the Holy Ghost. Whenever the Lord Jesus spoke to the Apostle Paul, or rather Saul of Tarsus, on that Damascus road, if you go down to verse number 18, God said, here is my task. This is what I want you to do. I want you to open their eyes. I want you to turn them from darkness to light. I want you to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. I want you to get, receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. And friend, that's exactly what a Christian is, all of those five things. Anybody ask you what's a Christian, and you want to give them a simple answer, turn you to verse 18 of Acts chapter 26, and there's your answer. What is a Christian, friend? First of all, to open their eyes. You see, before you'll ever be saved, friend, you've got to see your need. You've got to see your need. D.L. Moody said, 
I remember one night when the Bible was the driest and darkest book in the universe to me. The next night it was all light. I had the key to it. I had been born of the Spirit. But before I knew anything of the mind of God in His Word, I had to give up my sin. He'd got to see his need. And friend, a man will never be saved or be a Christian when they see they're lost. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, let me tell you, friend, do you not see your need? Do you not see your lost? Men and women, let me tell you, they're jiving and they're dancing on the road to hell tonight. And my, you look at the pubs and the clubs and all the rest of it, and my, they're having a great time, and yet they're standing in the very vestibule of God's eternity, and they can't see it. And if you were to tell them they need to be saved, they'd give you a slap in the mouth. I dare you. Do you know why? Because the devil has blinded their eyes. They can't see it. But a Christian's a person whose eyes have been opened, and God has shown him his need. I'm a sinner. Do you see that? Do you see it tonight? Notice, secondly, to open their eyes. And then it says to turn them, to turn them from darkness to light, because let me tell you, my friend, the word there to turn is to turn about, to turn around. There has to be a turn. What is this? You see, not only is there conviction, but before a man is saved, let me tell you, my friend, a Christian is someone who has repented of their sin. There's a change of mind. They have turned away from their sin. They've turned their back on their sin, and they've turned to Christ because genuine conviction will result in transformation. Not only do you see your sin and what it does, but you see where it will take you. And God hates your sin, friend. God hates your sin. But notice what you have to turn. There's a turning from darkness to light. The devil has blinded the eyes of them that believe not. You see, friend, in spiritual darkness, spiritual darkness, what's darkness? It's absence of light. That's what darkness is. Whenever the light comes, the darkness is dispelled. But glory to God and the sovereign plan and purpose of God for sinners. Men and women can hear that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And they turn from darkness to light. In other words, they turn to Christ. What did the psalmist say? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? What did Jesus say in that great chapter of John 3? He said this, Men love darkness. The sinner loves darkness. The sinner loves his darkness rather than light. Why? Because his deeds are evil. He loves his sin. But a Christian is someone who not only has his eyes open to his need, but turns from his sin to Christ, who's the light of the world. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Walking with Christ, friend. Once you... It says something to turn them from darkness to light and from the power, to turn them from the power of Satan onto God. In other words, they're transferred from the power of Satan onto God. The kingdom of darkness is ruled by Satan. 
does that mean? They're under the dominion and power and slavery of Satan. And the devil has us in trapped. The Lord Jesus said in Psalm 40, or rather the psalmist says, He drew me from the fearful pit. And in that Mary clay. You see, they were trapped in the fearful pit. They were down there in the muck and the mire of their sin. They were under the domination. But when a person see a friend from the power of Satan unto God, they're under new authority. You become a child of God. Now are we the sons of God. As many as received him, to them give he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. And praise God, whenever you're saved, friend, and when you become a Christian, you're no longer under the domination and the power of sin and Satan. What did Romans say? Over. You're no longer sin slave. Why? Because you've been set free. Set free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But where does that take us? Look next. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's the next thing. A Christian is a person whose sins are forgiven. And the word is, their sins are pardoned. They are remitted. In other words, the debt is cancelled. To release from the charge. What does it say in that eighth chapter of the book of Romans? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's Christ this day. Friend, let me tell you, whenever a person is saved, thank God your sins are forgiven. You know what God says? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, Thy sins and thine iniquities will no more. Now the devil will throw them in your face, but God's forgotten them. I think maybe I've told you before, meeting the W.P. Nicholson, and you know at times he can be very coarse in himself, and he was in a prayer meeting one night, and this wee man was praying. And he started to pray, and he says, Lord, Lord, you remember the kind of old rascal I used to be? And Lord, you remember the sins that, used, uh, that I used to, to delve into? And Lord, you know the things that I did? And Lord, you remember this and you remember that? And Nicholson could take it no more. He said, would you shut your mouth, you rascal? He says, that God knows nothing of the sort. God says, your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. No more. That they might receive the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And friends, let me tell you, your sins are forgiven through and cleansed in the blood of Jesus. There's something else about a Christian. Do you know what he receives as well? Not only does he receive forgiveness of sins, but he receives an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is. Thank God, friend, we have all of this and heaven too. Heaven at the end of the journey. I was standing beside a dear woman's bedside this morning in the hospital, called to it. You know, as I sat there, and, I just, and then I talked to that dear lady, and we rejoiced together in her knowledge of her sins forgiven. Friends, she has no fear. She may go home tonight, or she may not. But she's ready. 
an inheritance. An inheritance. I tell you this, friend. The inheritance that God has for you, money couldn't buy. Don't care what you have. And that's what Paul was doing, friend. That was the teaching. And Agrippa knew it. He said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He knew what it was. be a Christian but tell me thirdly quickly look at the tools we talked about the task we talked about the teaching what tools did Paul use to bring Agrippa he was trying to persuade them well what tools did he use intellectual tools oratory no, friend. Let me show you and just give you these because time's quickly going. First two, the Scriptures. Verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue to this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come to the scriptures and friend that's the authority of the pulpit the Bible and that's the authority in this pulpit it's the blessed word of God the word of God is a, a mirror the word of God is a two edged sword God is a hammer the word of God is a fire the word of God is a lamp the word of God is a light all of these things the Bible says about the word of God I'll tell you this that's the tool for the preacher. The Word of God. Why is it today that they have sermons hardly open? There's hardly a verse read, and if it is, then they shut the book, and that's the end of it. And then they'll go on to some homily of some stupid other thing to impress about what knowledge or oratory they have. Let me tell you, the authority of the pulpit alone is the Word of God. And friend, that's what Paul sought to use to win Agrippa, the Word of God. And there's power in that Word, let me tell you. There's an old preacher one time, and he was very nervous about preaching, and quite often he'd go out into a wood and they would talk away to himself. In other words, he would preach his message out in the wood. And this day, he went out into the wood, and he was preaching the message he was going to preach on Sunday. And unknown to him, there was a man lying in the ditch. And he heard the sermon the preacher was going to preach. And friend, through that sermon, the man lying in the ditch was one to Christ. And the man was hid from the preacher, but he wasn't hid from God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon went into the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And he was trying out the acoustics in the building. And he went into the pulpit, and he was standing there in the pulpit, and he thought there wasn't a soul there. And he stood in there trying to get the acoustics of the building. He cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And then he would say it again, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he tried out the acoustics and he said, you know, that'll be all right. And they didn't know, but there's a workman in the building that day. And all the workman heard, friend, let me tell you, was John chapter 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the Spirit of God struck that boy's heart. And that workman was saved. It's the power of the word. And that's how Paul, first of all, that was the first tool he used. It was the scriptures. Secondly, he used the tool of a plain, simple, clear presentation of the gospel. Look at verse 23. That Christ should suffer 
And that it should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people, to the Gentiles. Friend, that's the gospel, that Christ died. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul was giving a simple understanding of what the gospel is. And that's what he preached to Agrippa that day. The cross, the resurrection. That Christ died for our sins. He brought him to the cross. He brought him to the place where Jesus suffered and died. I thank God he wasn't presenting a dead Savior. He was presenting a living Savior, and that he rose again, that he should be the first to rise from the dead. He preached the gospel. Remember the text above the preacher's head. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The good news for sinners. He used, friend, was this, has his own testimony. Because you read that chapter and you'll find that Paul was giving his testimony. From verse 13 he said, At midday, O king, I saw a light. I saw on the way a light from heaven which shone round about me. Then he said, I heard a voice speaking unto me. Now notice the light shone around about me and them which journeyed with me. But the voice spoke to him. Because the call of the gospel is a very personal thing, friend. And Jesus said unto Saul, 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 I'm talking to you, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? And Paul gave us testimony. He was honest. He told them, listen, he says, my life is known by the people I was reared among. He says, the people of Jerusalem know that I was reared in a very strict Pharisaical home. A very religious upbringing. But you know, I went far away and, and, I, and I persecuted. I compelled the, the, the believers to blaspheme. And, and I was mad against them. And I persecuted them even onto strange cities. Verse number 11. I walked far from God. And then he says, listen, in grace, God met me. And God saved me. And God changed me. And you know, friend, let me tell you this. That's another tool that you can use to win souls for Christ is if you're living a testimony that they can see. You're living Christ. But there's one final tool he used. Because after all of those things, friend, then he made a personal appeal. Verse 27. King Agrippa, believest thou? And friend, I've seen men and women preach, or I've seen preachers preach the gospel to men and women. And they take them thus far, and then they'll close the service, and they'll never make an appeal to souls. They'll never make it applicable to the congregation. But Paul did. He looked Agrippa in the face and he said this, Agrippa, do you believe? Do you believe? Believest thou? There was an application. And I want to tell you, friend, if I'm not looking at you tonight, I want to tell you, I don't want to miss you because I pray the Holy Spirit of God will not miss you. King Agrippa was a Jew. He knew exactly what Paul was talking about. He knew about the Savior. He knew about the events in the life of Christ. He knew all about it. When Paul said, I know. I'm persuaded none of these things are hidden from, from you. Agrippa didn't deny. Agrippa didn't refute. For he knew what a Paul was saying was true. 
That was the tools. But then the trouble. Note what Agrippa said. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What stopped them? Let me give you the answer, friend. I believe there are three things that stopped them. Do you remember the woman sitting beside them? What do you call her? Bernice. Who was Bernice? Well, in chapter 24, you'll find there's a woman mentioned Drusilla. She was the sister of Drusilla. But there's something else. She wasn't Agrippa's wife. She was another man's wife. She was married. But she now listen to me carefully, friend. She was sitting there in her pump, and in all her glory. Who was she? She was the sister of Agrippa. They were living in an incestuous relationship. Brother and sister. In sin. And whenever Paul brought the challenge of the word of God, friend, Agrippa knew that he'd have to give up his sin. Why was he almost persuaded, friend? Because he loved his sin. And that's why men and women are not saved. They love their sin. If you're not saved tonight, friend, let me tell you, if I were to ask you why you're not saved, you'd say to me, well, I couldn't give you an answer, friend. But to be honest, you love sin. The thing that will take you to hell. Secondly, there was Festus. Do you remember what Festus cried out whenever Paul was speaking? He cried, Festus, he said, he said, Paul, you're mad. You're mad. So not only were pleasures, the pleasures of a sin blocking Agrippa, pride. Because he realized here was God's child and he was being mocked at. Agrippa didn't want to be mocked at. He didn't want to be thought mad. You know what the Bible says? The fear of man brings a snare. But friend, I think there was one other thing. Do you remember what I said earlier on? Paul talked about his bones. He was standing there in chains. And Agrippa loved his position. the pump. I can't leave my honored place for chains. And the last thought is this, the tragedy. Almost that's what he said, friend. Almost. Almost I persuaded me. Spurgeon said, almost persuaded. It's like a man who was almost pardoned, but was hanged. A man that was almost rescued, but he was burnt to death in his house. And a man that's almost saved is damned almost 
in 1830. George Wilson was convicted of robbing, robbing the U.S. mail. He was sentenced to be hanged. People made representation for Wilson to President Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States. President Jackson issued a pardon to Wilson, but he refused it. The matter went to the Chief Justice Marshall, who concluded that Wilson would have to be executed. He said, a pardon is a piece of paper. The volume of which, or the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. And if it is refused, then there's no pardon. And Wilson was hanged. In the Second World War, there's a young man, a young soldier, he fought from the beginning of the war to the end of it. Whenever the war was over, the victory was won. The lad called his mother from Europe and said, Mom, I'm coming home. The mother was delighted. Her boy had safely fought through the whole war, and now he's coming home. The lad got onto the plane, left Europe. And the plane was coming down in the United States. And the plane crashed. And the young man was killed. The preacher visited the home. The tears were running down the mother's face and she said, Preacher, he was almost home. He was almost home. But then he was dead. Maybe you're almost persuaded tonight. But it'll never take you to heaven. Almost thou persuadest me to be. To be a Christian. Will you be a Christian tonight? To be or not to be. That's the question. What's your answer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless thy word tonight. Write thy word upon our hearts. O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name that thou wilt not let men and women go away without you, but give them grace to come to you, that, O oh God, they'll be all together persuaded. Save them tonight. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing a wee verse of a hymn, 253. I want to stand to sing this verse, friend, tonight. You know the hymn it'll be, almost persuaded. Now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day. On thee I call. We're going to stand to sing verses 2 and 3. And then we'll close the service. Verses two and three.
bow our heads in prayer. Friend, tonight, I beg you in Jesus' name. I beg you in Jesus' name, don't be almost persuaded. But may God give you grace tonight to come by faith to Christ. The Spirit and the Bride says, Come, whosoever will, let him come. Oh, come to Jesus tonight, young man, tonight come to Christ. Mother, father, daughter, whoever you be, come and welcome to Jesus. What a tragedy. Almost, but lost. Not almost lost, friend. Almost persuaded but lost in your sin. We're here to help you. We'll gladly show you from God's Word how you can be saved. I appeal to you tonight, don't leave without Christ. Come and speak to us. Come around the side of the church or through the door at the front, but please don't leave without Jesus. May God bring you to himself. Lord, save tonight. For Jesus' sake.